screen or should I wait to record and then let me share it. Okay, let me change it to public. Um, what do we call this? It's still candid with Candace. Hoping it's both wrong. Okay. Then I need to share it once I see it on my phone. Okay, I think I see us. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Candid with Candice. This is still the Candice with an I show, but we're going to flip the script a little bit today, not because it's April Fool's, uh, but I'm going to introduce Candice in a very new way. And uh, you, she's going to be in the hot seat this time. Normally, she is the asker. Today, she is the ASCII. And I am absolutely honored uh, to be uh, talking to my, my fellow Candice in leadership. Hi, Candice. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm I'm doing well this April Fool's Day. I've been taken by a few jokes on Twitter, but I'm I'm working <laughs> through it. <laughs> same same here. I'm like people have so many jokes, and it's a pandemic. Like I thought we weren't doing it this year. <laughs> right, right. We should skip it. We should have just skipped it. Well, the one thing that is not a joke this April Fool's is Candace Quarles, and she is. Uh, going to be making a very big and significant transition, not just for her, but I think for the rest of us. Uh, she's going to be going from councilwoman uh, to consultant in the hopes to provide you or someone that you know, someone that you care about, with information about becoming an elected official in the DFW area. Uh, so Candace, people might want to know if you're going to be telling them how to get in the office about your journey. So can you tell me about your, your journey to councilwoman? Where did it start? Uh, where did this experience come from? Yeah, so I started, um, I was elected in 2016 in a special election. Um, and then I ran for re-election in 2018. So our terms are normally three years, but that was a special election. So I'll be wrapping up my term here on the city council uh, in May. Um, but it started with just a couple of leadership opportunities, I'd say, um, one, I'm active in my Delta chapter. So I was um, in the leadership and doing social action type of things. And then also I say Urban League Young Professionals. I was the president of the Dallas chapter. And that was my first taste of an election and, and getting people to vote for you and run and do all of that. So through that, um, I, after I rolled off when we had our, our, our baby, um, I, I decided I was gonna take some time and just see what's going on in the landscape. And then uh, in our city, we had an opportunity. Um, I speak open up and I ran for office and uh, won and then ran for re-election unopposed. And then in that time, I've uh, just done, just, you know, I wanna see good folks elected. I wanna see good folks elected at the local level. I wanna see folks getting on school board and city councils. And I, and you know, local politics candidates for us is uh, the most important because it's closest to the people. Right. Yes. Um, the things that we put in place, the things we implement, we feel that the residents feel that immediately. So I want to see more folks in office like us. And then I've just been helping and people call me and ask me questions. And I said, you know, we should really uh, get more folks uh, interested in local politics. So this is that attempt. And I've basically spent the last five years trying to get folks to pay attention to what's going on locally. And I think you've been doing a great job. I met you during your first term and I wouldn't have guessed that you were serving part of a term. 
at that very point. Uh, you were already training other candidates. You were already working to bring up a community of folks like a pro. And the biggest thing about it is that you can tell that you care so much about DeSoto. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about the makeup of DeSoto and, and the work that you've done in the community? Yeah, so um, DeSoto is, we're, we're over 50, 53,000 residents strong. So we're a makeup of uh, six, six city council members and a mayor. Uh, we have two, three-year terms for our term limits on city council. Uh, the city is majority uh, minority, so 80% black and brown. Um, and we are a suburb of Dallas. So uh, downtown to downtown, I'd say less than 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and we're one of those communities very, um, we're, we're right in the heart of what's going on in the Metroplex and also alongside the 35 corridor. So we're uniquely positioned to do a lot of great things. And um, the city is, I, you know, one of the things I, I, I wanted to push for or when I was in office thinking about how, what kind of things does uh, DeSoto need compared to other cities, you know? So when I'm representing this community, uh, majority people of color, are we talking about, uh, you know, minority contracting or making sure that minorities get bids or even, you know, win some of these contracts? Or are we just hoping that they do with a normal process and then kind of delving down into it? Um, and then also with our communities like in DeSoto, it's easy to, to skip over and talk about the Plano's and Frisco's and all of those um, suburbs. But one of the things that I think um, what positions us so well is that we're still small enough where we feel like, you know, it is community and neighbors know each other. Um, but also we're past in the in the in the city size is fifty thousand dollar the fifty thousand person markets when you start to become especially in Texas it's a large city, so um, how do we still provide all those services trash water sewer, uh, leads fire all those type of things at the level that all of our residents need it and we're only growing and growing each year. I love hearing your passion for your community and your passion for governance. I am such a governance geek and I love hearing that come out from you. But I, I want to know, how does that translate to your work when you're talking to folks, say, trying to get elected in majority uh, areas where there are mostly people of color or areas maybe there it isn't a majority person of color, but they're trying to talk to black and brown folks. How do you think that will affect your work? Yeah, I think um, we can do cookie cutter type of uh, policy. So some of the things that we implement, uh, particularly with uh, the minority women owned businesses, um, I'm sure that. Um, I don't know, a northern suburb, Pr Prosper, Frisco, all of those. I'm sure they have an importance on it, but it's even more important in our communities because those are our residents, those are our people. So if majority of those tax dollars are not going to people of color, where are they going to? So when I govern and I show up in the, the policies that I put forth, it is because of that's the makeup of our community. If we can keep our taxpayer dollars inside of DeSoto and DeSoto neighbors are getting contracts, um, minority community and minority businesses are getting those contracts. That only helps our city. So um, a lot of times I think um, it, it, when it shows up is, you know, you do a lot of black things or brown things and you talk about these issues, but it does any of us no good if we don't talk about the things directly affecting our people. Uh, one of the things that we have now is the, I'm talking about the ban the box ordinance where um, you can't ask questions about criminal history before you actually interview people. It's a simple you know, policy and it's something I spent 12 years in HR. So I know how that question is a barrier. Um, so in particularly in communities like ours where we're still arresting people for less than two ounces of marijuana or possession, um, that is, you know, that's impactful to not have to ask that question before we even meet each other. So I have the responsibility to show up and present policies such as those. And we have responsibility to our residents to, to also make sure we govern for everyone. And it can't be a cookie cutter approach. And that's great. Uh, looking at where those disproportionate impacts are and then making a real change in people's lives as opposed to giving lip service or, or putting up a hashtag or putting on a t-shirt uh, is going to make a really big difference in the way that folks get elected and then in the way that folks govern to, to help the most folks. But first we've got to get there, right? Uh, get so 
<laughs> you got to get elected. What's what to you is the, the toughest part about running a campaign? Um, the toughest part about running a campaign and what I see a lot of um, candidates do is waste time doing the wrong thing for a long time and then it's early voting in two weeks and they're like, ah, so um, I see a lot of people doing a whole bunch of social media and I did a lot of social media when I was running for office, but it definitely didn't take place of uh, knocking on doors and talking to residents. So if you're not talking to a resident or asking for money, but the weeks leading up to um, election day, you're probably spending time doing the wrong thing. Um, I see a lot of folks, you know, pay consultants and pay a lot of folks to do all of these things and their race has, and I and I asked the question, how many people voted in the last election? They're like 500. Okay, so why are you spending $10,000 with consulting for a race of 500 people? <laughs> and then particularly in uh, communities in North Texas, well, in Texas, we're one of the lowest turnout of voting. I mean, lowest turnout when it comes to local elections, 10% is awesome, and that's abysmal nationwide. But particularly in our communities, um, so many of the elections are being decided by less than 500 people. So you're telling me, if I gave you a list of 500 folks to talk to, you can talk to them at least three times before the election. That's the type of thing where I tell candidates, like you're doing the, you know, what what's with all these big flyers and yard signs and you have 500 people to talk to. I need you to go talk to them three times before <laughs> May comes along. So that's the kind of thing where I see, uh, we, we just need some help. And, you know, Candace, you and I, we've been through, we've seen it. We've seen how these elections go. We've seen it up, down, runoffs, uh, you know, round robin, Terry, we've seen all the turnout and then what ha what ends up happening is the same type of people get elected <laughs> and not anybody that's gonna bring real radical change to some of our communities and what we need. So that's why I said, I, I wanna help folks do the hard thing. And the easy thing is actually to run off for office. The hard thing is governance, like you said, once you get in, then what? <laughs> it's cool to be all Black Lives Matter during the, the protest, but after that protest that we hosted in DeSoto, I went to city council to talk about how minorities get contracts. So you have to do both, both and at the same time. So um, that, that's what I'm thinking about when, um, how do we get folks elected? How do they be effective once they're in office? And I, I remember I was there the time that you passed paid parental leave uh, for the city staff, and it was a huge deal. It reverberated throughout the country that a, a city in Texas, no doubt, was able to get that done. And so you were thinking about those deliverables, and you were also very, very good about uh, showing those deliverables to your community, to your constituents. I am, uh, I actually do read your emails. Uh, because your emails actually have content. It's really, really unusual in the political world to get emails with content as opposed to a bunch of sirens and ask for $10,000 or something. Uh, but you are working about being for, a local for the people. Office. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you are working for the people. Yeah, you know, and that's, that's the anniversary is coming up. So I think on April 2nd uh, in 2019, we passed Faith Family League. And Candace was... Candace, you were, you know, the main event in the in the article that they wrote about it, and you put uh, Baby Center on the podium, and it was just so sweet. And then just once, we got to show up for each other, right? Like you came from Cal Performance Branch down to our meeting, and to speak in, you know, one, you you were already a mom, and then you had a baby. Um, Houses like those were important, but if women like us aren't in office, who is implementing those things? And why would I expect? Um, an 80 year old white male whose children are my age to come and present paid family leave. That's not his lived right. experience right now, it's mine. So when we presented that, I knew it could work because I work for an employer that had it. And secondly, um, it's my responsibility and my duty, especially I have a daughter now. She should not, in, in whatever she has kids, I don't know, 20 years now, she should not be fighting for paid family leave. Right, that should be a right. nationwide policy, and it should be 15 years old by. <laughs> but um, she can't be fighting the same fights that we're fighting, and we shouldn't have to. You shared a story about 
having a room to breastfeed in at city council and how they put you in like a closet and the chair and that was it. Like no one should have to endure those type of things in 2021. So here we are, <laughs> the first doing this, first in North Texas. We're still trying to, you know, make sure women, moms have a place to do the basic thing that, you know, our bodies can do, which is feed our children. Uh, but it just hadn't, the question hadn't come up on city council or if, you know, they get pushed back and then she didn't have support. So she let it go. So, right. you know, family like family leave, pay sick leave, all these type of policies where we got to support working class people, working women. <laughs> and we can't do that if folks like us with that experience don't get into office. Absolutely. And I think that's something that is unique that you offer uh, that we have this experience that is becoming more common, but when we started, it wasn't that common. We were running for office with really, really little kids, tiny ones. And, you know, I, I had the opportunity at this past election cycle to work with a bunch of consultants. And even as I was hiring staff, because I knew a lot of them had not been around a kid that wasn't their Can niece I or interrupt nephew. you for a second and sure. flex on you? I want to flex on you because you just glossed over, like, I ran for office since last night. Candace is the 2020 Democratic nominee for Texas 24, okay? She ran for Congress. You raised, what, more than five million bucks? Five Good. million. Okay, she was one of the hottest races to watch. Unfortunately, she was turning a red to blue district, so she got within how many votes? 4,600. 4,600 votes. And that, what percentage is that? 1.3. 1.3% of flipping that seat. So while um, that the flip didn't happen, you made such a gain in your race. It was historic. Um, they put up so much money against you. I mean, I, I saw attack ads on you on the news and I was like, how do you talk about my friend like this? Like, hold on. Like, they know that I don't play with them on candidates, you know? So, I just want to flex on you a bit, along with being a trustee and being a local elected. She took it to the next level when she ran for Congress, y'all. And she did the thing. I was so proud, proud to know her. She ran a very clean and professional campaign and she got this close and she fundraised like the Dickens. <laughs> and she did a really great job. So I just want to acknowledge that. Candace, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I I am so focused on talking about you that that did happen, <laughs> but I'm I am just excited about what you're doing and and because you 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 understand a lot of what I was going through, uh, and just in that process of of running a gigantic congressional campaign, I had to deal with a lot of again consultants that only like dealt with their nieces or nephews or maybe had older kids. Uh, as I hired staff, I had to be very upfront because I started with a four month old and I said, I had to say, are you okay around breastfeeding? Because that's happening right. during this race. <laughs> this is happening while well, you're gonna ask me to sit in a chair and raise untold hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm nourishing a child. Mm -hmm. So are you gonna be okay with that or not? <laughs> and nobody for their part said no. Right. But it was there, everything that you do as okay, a woman, and then a woman of color. And then as a mom, you have to explain things every step of the way. If you were to work with say a mom who wanted to run for office, what do you think you would be able to provide? So for uh, women, I tell them they need, they, I think the number is seven times. Women have to be asked seven times to run for office. So for the women that are listening right now, would you please run for office? Can you please run for office? Can you consider running for office? Please think about running for office. So I knocked out four times for you, okay? We need you to run for office, but for women in particular, one is confidence. I, I mean, man, men wake up one day and they say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna be president of these United States. And then like they start going, women like have to, okay, this is not a good time for me, Candace. I got to wait to the end of the year. Okay, next time the cycle comes, up, okay, when my baby turns 17, I might think about it. I'm about to graduate school. I'm, I'm starting a new job, like confidence. So I would tell her, yes, you can do it. Now is the time that we need you. We, we don't need you when she's 17. She's six years old now. We need you to run for office now. So I would provide just the reassurance that you can do this and then steps every law and you know steps along the way of okay so 
the first thing is filing and you know you have to file a treasurer so who's going to be the treasurer that person's name is going to be linked to your name they're going to be on all your yard signs at the bottom as you know treasurer for a candidate of um i would you know share with them so for race in a suburb you might only be raising two three thousand dollars for a dallas city council race you could be raising half a million depending on what district you're in um, and i would share with them there are um, since there is, let's say, a 4% turnout in a local election, if, uh, if you knocked on 100 doors, do you want to knock on 100 doors to find four people who vote, or do you want to go knock on those four doors? Working with someone that knows what's going on will send you those four doors because they know where the data is, that all this information is public information, but how to sort it in a way where you can get volunteers and get folks to care about the mission and help you to get in the office. But for, um, it, it is, uh, it's been done. Um, you might not win the first time, but I've seen people come back and win a second time. Uh, this might not be the time for you. This might be the perfect time for you. If you're ready and you're thinking, I just need a push, I'm that person. Cause I, 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 I'll get you to the finish line. <laughs> if you're willing to listen and willing to learn, I get you there. And there's so many tools, but what happens is it's, 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 it's clouded in once you get in, I need you to do this. <laughs> Once you get here, I need you to vote like this. Um, it is, is, it's, um, if we always elect the same people, we're gonna have the same governing that we all complain about. So you have to get in the game. You have to get in the ring and um, make yourself known. Absolutely, absolutely. And you, you alluded to a couple of things, the differences of, of, of scale in terms of how much money you need to raise for specific races. And I remember, sitting in a folding chair in like a rec center in Arlington in 2017, like the very beginning of 2017. And you're up there and you're, you're giving me hard truths, Candace. You told me one, I had to get a Twitter account. I was not okay with that. I got it. I'm verified yeah. now. Okay. Aren't you <laughs> so verified? I'm you're verified. You I'm have verified. thousands of followers. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing you told me is it's, you know, like the day before you announce, you need to email a hundred of your closest friends and you need to ask them each for a hundred dollars. And I said, oh my God, I have to ask my friends for a hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. I think I should go home, but I was in a room full of people and I couldn't get up. Uh, so <laughs> but you were so, and again, this was your very first term. And you were, you were animated, you were informative, you were clear, you gave this really wonderful pathway here. So can you tell me a little bit, can you help me understand what the pathway is for these candidates uh, to raise money to, to run a campaign successfully? So yeah, you have to raise money. And the thing is, especially for women, we have no problem asking for money from for my son, PTO, build a, a bench for the teachers end of the year, such and such. We have no problem with church. They want to raise money for whatever church function. We have no problem doing that. But when it's for us, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. So I think in that training, we made it easy. And we made everyone pick up their phone and text five people and say, hey, I'm running for office. Can I count on you to give me 100 bucks? And you keep doing it until you get to five folks. I think that's what the exercise was. But usually I tell candidates, if you can't find five people to give you $50, you probably just don't have the support and it's less about money. That means they don't support your vision. For me, um, I know that I can ask for money. I know I'm comfortable with a no. So right, if I ask for a hundred people to give me a hundred bucks, okay, and they all say no, but four people did, that was worth it. That was worth, you know, the time that was spent. And then it's a text message, like how much money is that gonna cost you? It's not a pitch and I have to fly anywhere and have dinner with your family. So my friends, you support me, Candace Corals, you should be able to give me a hundred bucks. And if you say, Candace, I can't do it today, but on April 15th, I got you. Okay, my job as a candidate is to follow, follow up with you on the 14th or set a reminder in my text and say, hey, um, you know, here's the link in case you wanna go ahead and support. Make it easy to, for people to give you money, make it easy to support you. Um, and I know lots, lots of rich candidates and they always say, I'm not gonna ask you for money because I don't need it. But it's less about, is money, yes, you do need it to buy yard signs, t-shirts, the whole thing. But also when people are giving you money, they're a part of your journey with you, right? They're also running for office. They also are invested in, hey, could you share, they gave you money. 
So they're going to come to your swearing in. When you're in office, they're going to come and support you. So it is, it's, yes, it's giving money, but also, can I find a hundred, can I find five people that support my candidacy? Um, and that's why I tell people, pull out your phone now, because if you're not willing to ask for money, you're not willing to ask for a vote, what, what, what do we do? Like, who, what kind of thing are you going to get You have to ask <laughs> at some point. So I just, uh, a lot of candidates, that that is a piece, and I, and I get it. I was the same way. I was the same way, and then you get told no, and then you move on to the next person. And then one person, one of my friends, my attorney friends, they, uh, I asked for a hundred and they were like, girl, you should have asked me for five. Oh, shoot. See, that's the type of thing where if I had their real targeting and, and profile of the, the donors, I would have known that. Um, so yeah, I, most of the time I say folks, that piece is a big piece and I get it, but we all got to do it. And even when you're a seasoned expert at it, it's really important to have somebody to support you, especially as you get higher. I mean, there's been times where I would ask for $5,000 and then I would have to turn the phone away and I would just beat the person on the shoulder next to me because I had to not say anything as I was waiting for a, a yes or a no. And you can always pick yourself up, but it's so hard to get there. And that guidance is support is, is so important. That support is so important. So that leads me to my next question for you. Why, why do people typically need a consultant to come into their campaigns? Yeah, so I think um, uh, particularly at uh, where we're at now, it is, one is a good time in Texas to um, run for office. We're about to do some amazing things. I do believe the state is getting ready to flip and who doesn't want to be a part of that? Every a good, good Democratic candidate on the ballot helps drive turnout, right, for our side. Um, but the, the reason you need a consultant is we want to walk you through um, some of the pitfalls so you don't waste time, waste money. Um, I can tell you which candidates, which uh, consultants are doing good work. I, I can, can also tell you where to order your yard signs to make sure it's a union printer. Um, I will be able to share with you um, what's a good text messaging service. People love sending out texts and I spend more money on um, uh, a good Facebook ad before I do text messaging. But if you have money to do both, then do both. But let's not like saturate it more than actually talking to people. Um, so the, the, that's the type of thing and uh, making sure, you know, folks know the thing about us, it's hard to know it's a local election going on. People know presidential, right? It's billions of dollars being spent in November. Um, but just six months later, like no one even knows that we're having a, a major election. Um, in Texas. So it's about getting out there and getting to know you as a candidate. So um, that's what I look for. That's a piece that I love is, is getting to introduce good folks to new people to say, hey, think about them. They have a vision for your city that you could, uh, you know, grab onto. They, they need support. Um, they, they, you know, they might be a little younger than you expected, might be a little more seasoned than you expected. But they, they're talking the right things. And then the changes you talk about, this is what they have. This is what they are. So I would implore people to um, definitely, if you want to talk further, definitely reach out to me. Uh, my email is Candace at Candace Quarles. So uh, you can look it up or look my name up on Facebook. It's Candace, Candace with an I, Candice. And um, certainly just come and, and we can have a conversation about what do you think you're needing? Uh, we're about exactly a month, a month out from the local elections now. So how are people Faring, what are they looking like? The endorsement screening process, the um, candidate forums, the uh, text messaging services, the uh, the mail, those things. Um, I know where to go, where to point you, or at least on uh, trusted advisors of people I can support you and tell you who's doing this and who does it well. And that actually leads me to my next question. It's already April 1st and most municipal races in North Texas are on May 1st. So is it too late for you to help folks? Are you already helping folks that are thinking about it down the line? How does that work? Yeah, definitely not too late. Um, you know, with a local election, one thing could turn into a turn a race upside down. And I've seen it happen. Um, a month is plenty of time. If you aren't canvassing, walking, phone banking, those type of things, there are services that do that. Uh, I can connect you with those people. Um, if you just have a bunch of things and you're spending money left and right, we can prioritize what's important to spend money on, but definitely it's not too late. Um, this isn't a congressional presidential campaign, right? This is a local race. 
So um, yes, you should have a plan. You should know by each Saturday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. where you're going to be each Saturday. If you don't know that, I would implore you to get uh, to, to reach out and get some support because we have four Saturdays left and um, Saturdays are important in the local race, especially in this one. Well, if people want to know how to connect with you, you mentioned your, your email is it is Candace at CandaceQuirls.com, right? Uh, what are other email. ways folks, what are, way, what are other ways folks that can stay connected with you, keep update on, uh, updated on what you're working on? Yeah, so um, I have uh, three two meetings, three meetings left. Depends on if we go into a runoff. So I have three meetings left on city council, and um, I am following on my my Facebook page at Candace Corals and the other ones Councilwoman at Candace Corals. But I'm on all of the social media with my first name and last name, or it is Candid with Candace. And um, so I have these videos that I help, especially if you don't know what a precinct chair is or what's going on, what's a runoff. We have some informative videos like that. But yeah, follow me on any of those. You can reach out and uh, message me and I check everything all the time at any time. And you just email me Candace at Candace Corals and I certainly uh, reach back out to you. All right, well, Candace, it has been absolutely incredible just having the chance to be on candid with candace i've been wanting to be on this show for like a year and a half now <laughs> i finally made it <laughs> you made it okay you finally made it. <laughs> no i appreciate you candace and i don't know what you're doing next um but hopefully we see you again in the future and definitely anytime you need me to throw down um you know, I, I'm in your corner, one of the best elected officials in North Texas, just, just true integrity and just true to the word and, and, and really about like supporting women. Uh, and and, and we, we've been in each other's corner for a long time, but I just truly appreciate your friendship and the work and the leadership that you bring. And, uh, and kudos to you for stepping up to Congress. That's something, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're doing it. So thank you for uh, leading the way and showing the rest of us. And I appreciate you too. You have been working to uplift women in your community, women in the elected community for a long time now for absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that the the skill that you've you've cultivated over years and the knowledge that you've cultivated over years uh, should be paid. And I'm really happy that you're entering into a space that needs you because there aren't enough moms, there aren't enough Black moms that are working to get folks elected, even though we are working to get folks elected for free, for free. all of the time, <laughs> for many, many years. Many, many years. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for doing this work now. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep it going. Absolutely. Well, if you have any questions, please, please, please follow Candace Quarles. Uh, if you are one of my friends and you want to get in touch with her, just DM me. I, I will connect you. All right. I appreciate you, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, y'all.